Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, folks. Hey, welcome to another episode of the Marketing You Practice podcast, the podcast where I get to simplify the marketing and the mindset necessary so chiropractors can increase their income, increase their impact, and their enjoyment in practice too. Over the years, I get asked the question, what do I think the number one factor is that determines success for a chiropractor as well? And when I think about the answer to that question, my answer is really simple. It's this, it's certainty. Rock solid certainty on the value that you deliver to your patient and the wider community there will make up for just about any other shortfall that you have in practice. Now, for many chiropractors, the journey towards increasing and developing real certainty in practice is akin to Frodo's journey in Lord of the Rings. It's full of dragons and failure and unclimbable mountains. Now, the good news is it absolutely doesn't have to be that way. Certainty in practice comes from many things. It starts with you getting really clear around your paradigm of practice. Again, getting some clarity around what you do and don't do, understanding then things like tissue healing, and then having a good system and a framework to be able to communicate it. Now, my guest on the show today has developed a brilliant framework. Um, he's been on the show many a time. He's one of my greatest friends, Martin Harvey. And in today's episode, Martin will take you through the steps to help you navigate towards having that rock solid certainty as well. Uh, this episode is full of wonderful strategy and tactics. It's easily implementable. So tomorrow, whatever day it is for you, you'll be able to start to put things in place that'll increase your certainty in practice and therefore increase your success in practice as well. As always, folks, thanks for all that you do. Keep saving lives. Let's go chat with uh, with Martin. Let's go chat with Martin about certainty. See you in there. Martin Harvey, welcome to the Marketing Your Practice podcast. Buddy, how the heck are you? I am really, really good. It's great to see you and all, as always, great to be back on the podcast. I sort of feel like I've got a try and catch up to Dr. Sullivan somehow, I've got to, uh, try and chip away at his lead. Yeah, absolutely. We'll, we'll, we'll keep working at it there as, as well. You're back to your busy beaver kind of self again. Um, just had a weekend down in Tasmania, um, yes. teaching chiropractors back um, down there as well. We're going to talk about one of my favorite topics today. Um, I spent, I think, the first 10 years in practice on a quest for certainty, um, which I sometimes kind of bracketed with um, confidence because it seemed to me to be the elixir uh, that, you know, I kind of saw these other chiropractors out there and people wanting to know, like, what do you say? Like, how, what do I say in my new patient visit? And what do you say to get it? And I thought none of, none of those things really matter if I don't have the certainty that kind of sits underneath them as as well so um let me start with this what is certainty when you talk about certainty as well and why do you think it's so damn important for the chiropractor to have yeah i, I guess i have a real I, I went through the same journey where i remember going to the seminars as a student and hearing that certainty was sort of the the key element uh, and i think i remember listening to these sort of bootleg tapes from the US and I remember I can't remember who said it but they re I remember saying something like uh, who you are speaks so loudly I can hardly hear what you say and it sort of struck me as one of those things that was like there's an element behind it. people can be practicing the same technique they can be using the same practice management approach they can be using the same communication templates or scripts or whatever and get very very different results and I think certainty is different to confidence but related there's sort of one of those Venn diagrams and so certainty when we say confidence we're often sort of talking about how uh, how much you value your own ability to do something. To mm -hmm. me, certainty is a little bit bigger than that in that, yes, you have your confidence in your ability to uh, deliver an adjustment. You have confidence in your knowledge of when to deliver an adjustment or provide any other form of care and when not to. And you have confidence in your ability to explain things in a clear and succinct, and succinct way. And it's coupled with a understanding, not a faith, an understanding and knowledge of the potential impact of applying chiropractic care. So it's, it's sort of this confidence in your own skills as well as a uh, knowledge-based 
I've thought about this and I know who I can help and how much I can help, how much potential I have to help them. Mm -hmm. And also sort of a, a certainty or confidence in being okay that it's that it's that sort of 80 10 10 80 percent of people are going to get really really good results 10 percent of people are going to do a little bit better and 10 percent of people for whatever reason haven't read your textbook and you probably mm. need to navigate a way to get them the help that they need that it may not be with you so that in a long form is certainty if i was to drill it down to a shorter version it's the knowledge and confidence that you can deliver on the promise of chiropractic Yes. For me, I don't know, I, I often wondered that there is a, a societal belief that I bought into that chiropractic is unscientific, yeah. uh, that there is a level of quackery, that there's also, you know, we're perhaps not all that qualified, maybe not even safe as well. And a lot of that kind of really fed into my, it was kind of certainty of, like, am I a valued member of a healthcare provider team as, as well? Like all of those things that, you know, I don't imagine, I don't know, like, do you think that the medical profession worries about certainty in the same way chiropractors do? Well, no, I think we've got an extra challenge for certainty. And we certainly don't. One of the things that really, uh, and part of the reason that I, uh, I want to talk about certainty is that I, for a number of years, taught a certainty course. But one of the things that prompted me to really explore where certainty came from was a chance encounter I had. This is going back years and years ago, but it was sort of a couple of things that happened um, step by step, uh, or sort of close together. And one of them was I went for a walk with a with my dog and I happened to run into somebody walking in the same park with me and our dogs were sort of playing and I ended up chatting to this young woman and I had been in practice for a while at this stage, maybe six, seven years, and she was a student physiotherapist. Mm. And I was sort of, oh, I'm curious, what are you doing? She was doing a clinical placement and she was working in a rehab center where they were working with people who were inpatients in a rehab center that had had physical injuries and they had this rehab process. And when she was describing what they did with them, if I can be really direct, and I don't mean this to be sort of derisive of physiotherapy, but it sounded pretty shit. Like it just all sounded like not that much impact. When you think of the sort of stuff that I feel like we would do with somebody who had a fairly significant physical challenge, we've got the power of this neurological input that can kind of reset things pretty rapidly and with impact. And she was doing this very not passive but very minimal input stuff with these people mm. not expecting and doing it daily except for the weekends that you know it was five days a week it was daily except for the weekends and that people would have this daily regimen for 12 weeks and she what struck me was that she had as a student not having graduated she had absolute certainty in that this was the best thing that people could have but from the outside I looked at it and I go it sounds really shit you got a bad product but you're certain in it whereas I think for a lot of chiropractors they had I had this insight we've got this amazingly impactful suite of skills most especially the power of an adjustment and we lack a, a lack certainty in it and some of that is that is it scientific is it valid and I think there's other reasons why certainty tends to be lower but that's certainly part of it mm -hmm. um, that there, there's that sort of cultural authority aspect of it that where we come in with a sense of well, look there's a lot of criticism of our perspective where there's smoke there's fire maybe you know I should shouldn't be so certain in this stuff and I think that's part of the reason why I sort of look at certainty particularly with chiropractors early on but it still happens to people after 10 20 30 years in practice that mm. often if you haven't done the work to clarify your thinking around things it's this roller coaster of certainty and you go along and do a, an adjusting seminar or a neurology seminar or a you know Dan Murphy Heidi Horvick whoever seminar and you come out of it super certain in chiropractic because you've got this picture of the value of it in through this lens of whether it was a science-based lens or a technique-based lens or whatever else and then it sort of leaks out over a period of time 
when you run into mm -hmm. the, the, the uncertainty of daily clinical encounters of people saying things that are critical of chiropractic, and, you know, you quacks, you're dangerous, you're unscientific, or you run into clinical scenarios where there's an uncertainty attached to it in terms of are you delivering on the promise? So, you know, mm -hmm. somebody comes in and says, oh, I don't really know whether this is working for me or you hurt me or my friend said that I should be doing Pilates instead of this or whatever it is. There are these things that can kind of undermine your certainty and it sort of leaks out over a period of time. And to me, unless you do the work to sort of clarify the paradigm that you're practicing under and some other things it's always going to be this roller coaster yes. but you, your experience maybe helps you sand off some of the rough edges of that up and down yeah i think it's interesting too because I'm, I'm kind of replaying in my head some of my journey and that initially when i wanted to clarify that stuff the solutions were given to me more from there was an element of practice management to try and provide yeah. certainty there too and if it wasn't that it was kind of answered like well how often do you like get adjusted well once a week so therefore that's what you should recommend to other people and I'm like well that look that's a reasonable way to go about finding a solution for it but is there anything else that you know I'm, I'm sure that the answer that this physiotherapist student with their five times a week didn't come from that's a great way to build your practice or um, if you <sighs> injured your elbow, how long would you do it there too? To, no. for, it, it seems that for some reason, and, and you're one of the first to, and we'll talk about the framework in a moment there to go, no, 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 there's a very obvious way to answer this question. Um, you yeah, know, yeah. there's supportive science and logic oh. that can really point us in a direction that can kind of help us answer these questions as, as well. And I don't know why it's taken so long for the profession to kind of have that mature conversation. Why do you think that is? I think that there's a few elements. The first one is if we look at it as our procedures, so the things that we say and do in practice, if they're aligned with our paradigm, which is sort of the model of, care that we provide and the rules around what we do and when we do it and who we take care of and who we don't if the paradigm if the procedures align with the paradigm and the paradigm aligns with the philosophy then that creates a really cohesive sense of certainty so if we look at our physiotherapy student physiotherapy doesn't have an alternate philosophy to the predominant health philosophy that our culture has they have more or less the same thing which is a, largely a symptomatically oriented philosophy with maybe a little add-on of prevention whereas mm -hmm. chiropractic has other elements to it around performance and we have a different perspective around the um the role of symptoms and that there's the, the highest value for many of us is in um applying care where regardless of symptoms and in fact when you don't have symptoms that's where the real juice and the life enhancing aspect of chiropractic can come in so we have this philosophy <clears throat> excuse me but then we often don't then take that and most of us if we're asked about the individual elements of that philosophy we're pretty certain that they're good observations and they're robust observations. So if we look at one way of stating them, and I know this isn't the 33 principles, but if we were to not go through them individually, but look at the three that most impact our provision of care, it would be how certain are you that the body is self-healing, self-regulating, self-developing? Mm. And most people that I ask go, yeah, 100%, that is the way that it is kind of set up to be. And then the central role of the nervous system in regulating all physiology and therefore healing, developing, and uh, I've forgotten one of them. What is it? Healing, reg uh, regulation of function, um, healing, and development. Mm. And then the, the final one, the sort of clinical application of that is if we find any, a source of interference to that nervous system function and we apply our care, our adjustments to remove that interference, regardless of whether somebody feels a change with that, that is good for how their body is functioning, how it's able to heal, regulate and develop. And so most people, if you ask those three things, how certain are you? They go, yep, I'm 100% certain in it. However, we haven't then aligned our or clarified our paradigm and then clarified how we'd apply that. So our physiotherapy buddy, she 
didn't have this alternate philosophy. And then she had a paradigm. And they, one of the really interesting things, and you know, when we look back to sort of a framework around one of the things I think can really massively upgrade your sense of certainty is they apply very, very routinely a model of care based on understanding of soft tissue healing timeframes. Yes. So that you're looking at an injury in their context and saying, well, look, if there's muscles that are involved, then muscle healing timeframes are probably somewhere in the range of six to 12 weeks and we'll have a way of grading severity. And that will give me kind of a model of expected timeframes for outcomes. And then the severity and the chronicity matrix will then give me an idea of how the input should be graded up or down to compensate for that. And then if somebody then has a more significant injury that has ligamentous um, or disc impacts, then we're going to expand those time frames because those tissues take longer to adapt and remodel. And similarly, neurological changes that are associated with it might um, alter those bindings. And so they have this sort of understanding that soft tissue healing timeframes should set the overall timeline and severity and chronicity should set the uh, the time, the intensity levels of your input and the person's home input. Yep. So they've got a paradigm of, well, then my interventions are designed um, to have an impact on the integration of those tissues, the response of those tissues over that time frame, And that's sort of a, a really simple paradigm that you can apply, but it's because it's clear, because it's got guidelines, it's sort of clear to see, oh, this person is, doing what I might expect because of the timeline and our analysis of their severity and chronicity, and this person isn't. Um, so there's that alignment of the philosophy to a paradigm. And then their procedures are sort of more or less, you know, you don't question them because they're aligned with the paradigm. I'm just trying to change this thing. And I might have three different tools. I might be able to do a hands-on physiotherapy muscle technique, or I might have them doing various modes of exercise, or I might be applying a, uh, some sort of machinery, electrophysical therapy sort of stuff. And I, there's a bit of nuance in how you'd apply that, but my paradigm is clear. And so my procedures, so long as they align with that paradigm, all make sense. I've got certainty in it straight away as a student. So the challenge for us is we've got that alternate philosophy and we then need to think through how we apply that. And we also have some fairly different paradigms of application. So I don't think there's one paradigm of chiropractic. I think there's a bunch of different ways that you can apply that, but doing the work to apply that then makes it super easy to work out, look, procedure wise, what am I going to do? And I, I think sometimes I've oh, gone. Uh, are there, sorry, are there any shortcomings in us looking at subluxation as an injury? And taking that same thing that says, look, we've got a joint here that has components of change in movement too much, yeah. not enough there too, associated soft tissue and neurological changes there as well. And even if we yeah. take into the idea of a physical, chemical or emotional stressor that caused it there as well, are there components of it that could not be just addressed as an injury? No. I don't think so. I think yeah. so long as you're not wedded to the idea that an injury has to be symptomatic, yes. I think it's a really important thing for us to recognise that you that asymptomatic joint dysfunction, subluxation, whatever term you like to use for it, is a really common and important thing for us to be yes. aware of and address. I think that's one of the key things that is, yes. a, is able to create a huge amount of certainty for people is to borrow from the physiotherapy profession where they've done a really good job of saying let's look at the, and they're simple frameworks but they are really transformative in terms of the clinical application of you can yeah I, I think too when I think about an injury there too the two things that come to mind without thinking any depth of it is symptoms and is trauma um mm. And then we tend to think of trauma in terms of macro. I tend to think of trauma in terms of yeah. macro trauma, where yep. subluxation is often without symptoms and very often without macro trauma as well. This, you yep. know, chronic buildup of postural stress there as yep. well, and or you know the components of 
you know, emotional stress changing physiology as well yep. there. But otherwise, I've, I've not, I've not actually ever classified it in my mind as an injury, although that's very much the way that I've looked at it. You know, my pathway through to certainty was looking at it here and saying, look, as a neurological and biomechanical unit, what is going on here? What do we have? Aberrant range of motion, um, you yep. know, inflammation, et cetera, et cetera, and then gave me directions to, to go as well. So I think if I can just interrupt there, I actually think that's a really useful part of it yes. and the, the adding the injury concept around it is really just and if injury isn't the term to use you don't you can look at it more as the what are the sequelae of having this change in biomechanics and neurology uh, but it's really looking at what has been the impact of this having been there for a period of time so that I can then get a sense of moving forward because a huge number of the ways that people lose certainty is in not being certain how to, first of all, sort of track that people are improving. But even if they've got some good tests to know that somebody is doing better separate to their symptoms, because that's a really important thing. If you look at the physiotherapy model, because it's built on that idea of symptoms and what matter, mm. the most important thing for you to measure is their symptoms. If ours yes. is saying, if our one of our core ideas is you can't judge how healthy you are or how healthy your spine is or how well your spine is by how it feels, you probably want some good ways of measuring whether you're doing better, they're doing better. The next question past that is uh, if they are doing better, could they be doing better more quickly? And for you to have a framework of answering that, you need that time frame piece uh, to some degree answered. Because there's somebody coming to you and saying, I've been coming in for six weeks and I don't, I'm not feeling any different. That's a question that can either be, and this is where that sort of practice management piece of the puzzle can be an important but incomplete answer to it, because often the answer there is, well, we've got you on a 12-week program and everybody's on a 12-week program. So where there, to me, there are some clinical scenarios. If somebody has a, a fairly recent development of subluxation and not a particularly severe level of subluxation, my paradigm would say we should be measurably able to demonstrate significant change in that time frame. Yes. And there would be other people where I would look at it. If I, my testing shows high levels of chronicity and high levels of severity, six weeks, I'm not surprised there's nothing changing. I'm, it's just that's expected because of the understanding of the time that it takes for physiology to change. Yes. I, I, there's two things I want to touch on here as, as well. <clears throat> I'm, uh, I want to come back. I'm going to start with this. Too often we shy away from, and I hear other practitioners shy away from this idea of there being like a cookie cutter approach, mm -hmm. you know, three times a week for six weeks, twice a week for, and whilst I'm not for a cookie cutter approach per se, when patients ask me this type of thing, now I'll often ask them a question back and say, have you ever noticed that you know, when your child goes along to the doctor and gets a course of antibiotics that it's twice a day for the first week and then they work off them and they go there for an ear infection. But when you went there for a bladder infection, you got the same antibiotics and you got the same recommendation. And one of you was seven, one of you is 37. These are based on the reason that they do that is there is a way that their physiology changes with the antibiotics independent of the person. While she might have to have them stronger and longer per se, an adjustment is much the same way. So I just want to reinforce our listeners. Don't fall into the trap of just because it's cookie cutter that it's bad. We, we are no. dealing with similarities in physiology here as, as well. Yeah. Um, the, the second thing in there too, I, I, I was just thinking about it too. You know, elements of certainty are one I've, I need to find an objective way of finding this thing, which I'm happy to call subluxation. Yep, um, yep. I, I need to have an effective intervention that changes the above identified finding. And then yep. I need to have, again, a way of remeasuring the thing afterwards and see, does it change? Now, yep. if I can do those three things there too, then I got to tell you at this stage, it's fucking hot dog. Like that's yep. it. Like really, yep. it, once you get that in place, and, and then you can start to take in those other things in place 
and also give yourself a break that there is there is still art to this um, yeah. as as well the two you have a framework for this we've sort of danced all in around there too and yep. um, full disclosure Martin teaches a course on this which I'll tell you guys about at the end I've done it it's freaking brilliant to be honest everything Martin does is brilliant and just from now on and all episodes going forwards and all ones past when Martin does stuff just buy it okay you'll be very <laughs> very grateful that you have I'm, and I have said this to a lot of people and I've not ever had one person come back to me and go Angus that was a waste of money they, like me, just continue to fall more in love with his brilliance. But let's talk about that framework yeah. Um, yeah. as well. And we can give the chiropractor some homework to do with it because they can do it themselves or if they want yeah. some more help, they want speed of implementation, they should buy your stuff. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks very much for your positive comments about my stuff. I really, really appreciate it. I feel like I'm blushing a little bit here, so I'll move on to... Uh, <laughs> oh, awkwardly to just kind of value. another way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So really, so in the program, the first step is that I get people to, to essentially do an audit on where they don't feel certain or where they do feel certain, because that's a really useful exercise to do. Now, um, there's a survey that we run people through, but if we really, if you were doing it solo, uh, the first question really is the question that I asked you beforehand, because the, the overall flow of what I'm trying to do is start off with are you certain in those core ideas of the philosophy, self-healing, self-regulating, self-developing, nervous systems, master control system, if it's being interfered with and you adjust people and the interference is reduced, that's a good thing in all those domains. If you're pretty highly certain in that, then I think you might get a lot of intellectual enjoyment and gradual uh, expansion of your understanding of chiropractic by exploring the philosophy, but it's probably not where your philosophy, where your certainty dips. Yep. The, but we would then look at, in terms of paradigm, um, I would be looking at those questions that you were just talking about there in terms of testing. What is the, succinctly, what is the model of subluxation or joint dysfunction or whatever term you want to use? uh that you use in your practice how do you how do you define it how do you measure it and how do you measure it visit to visit so that you know where you're going to apply your adjustment where you're going to apply your skill how do you know that you've finished for that visit then yes. similarly how do you apply that model in terms of measuring progress over a period of time because we've got these soft tissue healing time frames that go in typically six to 12 week cycles but you know say if we're looking at somebody with significant involvement and adaptation or maladaptation of ligaments and discs you could be talking nine months 12 months 24 months that it's going to take but over a series of those how can you track that separate to your daily analysis that this person is improving in the function of their spine as aligned with that model of, of care or model of subluxation. So there's the testing piece of it. And then there's another piece around that, which is what I think of as clinical rules, because we've got that very specific part of it, but often people will feel uncertain in other areas. And so I'll give you a couple of examples. Mm. Um, the scenario that I often give to people to, to sort of illustrate the overall concept of it is to ask them two parallel almost case studies. So if somebody was to come and see you and say, they said, oh, look, I've got a bit of a stiff neck and you ask them other questions and they go, oh, look, I guess gradually over the last year or so, I've just had a bit of brain fog and I've just been feeling not kind of as energetic as I have previously and just, you know, feel a bit flat. Um, most chiropractors have asked how certain are you that you may be able to help this person with their stiff neck but bigger than that you may because of your understanding of afferent neurology and a bunch of other things you'd be reasonably certain that they may notice some improvement in some of that other stuff the brain fog and just feeling a bit flat most chiropractors are like yeah i'm pretty sure that i'll be able to help that person with that area mm -hmm. equally if somebody came to see you and said I've just had the worst headache I've ever had in my life. I'm now slurring my words and the right side of my face is starting to droop. And if I poke my tongue out, it goes on a weird angle. You could be equally certain that while in the future, that person might benefit tremendously from chiropractic, right now, they need to be going to the emergency room because they're probably having some fairly significant neurovascular issue 
and adjusting them is not a great idea. And there's a whole lot of more subtle things that you there's a huge amount of certainty in defining whether they are your job or they're not your job because people can have their certainty rattled by taking on things that probably they don't necessarily have the paradigm and skill set to help with. So let's say you, so let, a, a subtle example would be peripheral joint subluxations. Mm. So you can look at it and you can go, well, if somebody comes in and says, can I check your knee? You could make the example of, oh, well, it's not the spine and that's sort of what I'm about. So no, I won't do that. But you could equally make the claim, well, they have joint receptors, mechanoreceptors, nociceptors that would also cause disafferentation if they weren't working properly. So maybe they should be part of my uh, my role. And I don't think there's a right or wrong answer to that, but I think you should be clear on it so that you then, if we go back to that role of certainty, it's to give you clarity in terms of your communication and your procedures. You go, well, yep, that's not really my area or yes, I can do it. And here's the communication that delineates when I will say, actually, you need to go and see somebody else about that. But knowing that in advance is really powerful in terms of certainty because it allows you to make decisions and not feel like, well, how big do I allow this to get? I've worked with chiropractors who are sort of like, they get uncertain because they're that stress impacts people's development of subluxation and does that mean I should be, if people are having a really tough time in a relationship, I should be helping them with that? And, you know, have lack people have, to take a really extreme example, um, you know, people not having a good sex life is bad for their stress levels, is bad for their, their spine and nervous system. How far do you want to take this? Like, it's just being clear in this area. And I say that as, you know, a jokey example, but there are a lot of things around that. Another one that I think can be really... I say that not because the conversation that Angus and I were having beforehand, in which case, buddy, the sex life, it'll get better, okay? Just <laughs> it's time at the moment, all right? Oh, I and set myself up for that. And it's not because you're subluxated as well. So I haven't been missing anything <laughs> with regard to my adjustments are great. Nicole just needs time, all right? So I've, I've told oh, you that a number oh. of times. So, uh, yes. Anyway, uh, back move to, on. Back, yeah. back to blushing. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, this area of rules is really important. And so it can cross over areas like vaccination. Do you, in Australia, we have rules that define whether you should or shouldn't speak about vaccination, but that's not always the case for all chiropractors around the world. But being clear on is it your job or isn't it your job yes. is quite liberating in terms of promoting certainty. Yes, I learned in the coaching course that I did last year, we did a lot of work in around boundaries. And I love it because you either have the pain of setting the boundary or you have the pain of resentment. There's mm -hmm. always pain. One of them you get to choose though. So yeah. if you lay down clearly, it goes, yeah, man, I'll adjust your knee. I love doing that. It's easy. I'm great at it. The 205th, my model there as well. But, you know, if it comes to doing, you know, there will be a line for you. But yep. getting clarity in around where that is and taking the time mentally, emotionally and the pain so to get clarity in around the boundary there, um, I, I think is super valuable as well. Or if not, um, resentment is what is going to kind yeah. of kick in. So, yeah, I love it. So resentment's one piece of it. And there's also the one of the, if we look at all these clinical things, a really important thing to that I think can be a bit of a flag of, where you are losing certainty. So if, if people are wanting to sort of increase their area of certainty, the, the mechanism that I suggest that you do is anytime you feel anything but 100% certainty when you are in a clinical situation is you write that down and you say, the next time this happens, this is what my rule is. It's what's called an if-then rule. Yes. Um, so it, it is the, the mechanism for creating these rules over a period of time. And um, if we look then at, at the, the effect as well as resentment, so you end up doing things that you're sort of like, oh, shit, I don't want to be doing this. I don't feel like I'm good at it or I don't feel like it's as important as the other stuff or whatever form of resentment there is. All of these things feed into what I think is clinically one of the biggest causes of a loss of certainty is not knowing when you should be done. So if you look at the really certain chiropractors, uh, they, from a clinical perspective, 
you observe them and you're often surprised at how little they do yes. because they have prioritised this is the most important thing. And if you look at the least certain chiropractors, my observation would be they're doing more and more and more and more and more things because they feel like if I just cover every base of everything that this person could ever possibly need, that's the path to helping them most without recognising what I think is an important distinction, which is sometimes doing more overcooks things sometimes over it reduces the body's ability to adapt to the most important inputs and so less is more is often mm -hmm. uh, a better strategy for them and for you yes ha but having the certainty to do that though requires you to know be certain in what your end point is and that loops back to what you were talking about in terms of those end indicators and then these rules that add on to it. So for a very specific example of where I've seen uncertain chiropractors create a bit of a knot for themselves is in the area of soft tissue work after yes. an adjustment, before an adjustment, whatever your model is. However, a lot of them will do it as a way of sort of feeling I'm not certain in the value that I'm providing. So I'm going to do a bunch of this so that it feels to them like I'm doing more and you know, the $70 for the adjustment feels more. Uh, value and yes. then there's a whole so if we're forming a clinical rule around it again there's perspectives I'm not saying you should or you shouldn't do any but you should have a way of knowing when you do it and when you don't yes and it should be um, based on your paradigm so if we look at a, that paradigm of subluxation we were talking about we've got this core idea of a joint that's not moving the way that it should it's creating abnormal stress or strain on the surrounding soft tissues. They're richly innovated with mechanoreceptors and nociceptors. The abnormal stress or strain is going to trigger some changes in there where we get decreased mechanoreception, increased nociception. That combination is called disaffrontation. It's going to cause some changes in local spinal cord mediated reflexes, a whole bunch of things to go on in the central nervous system. But at the spinal cord, the body's response to those change in spinal cord mediated reflexes that's going to alter the neuromuscular control of that segment of the spine is going to be to increase the local activation of postural muscles. So if we're talking the lumbar spine, it might be quadratus lumborum, piriformis, psoas, whatever, whatever, whatever. Mm. You could make the argument that doing something to address them might help the body unwind that subluxation better, or you could make the argument that it's going to destabilize it and make it harder for the body to uh, adapt. This is one of those things where there isn't research that shows, to my knowledge, whether one way is objectively better based on outcomes or better based on pre-post range of motion, pre-post EMG or any of those things. So you've got to find a way of sort of defining when and where you do and how much of that you do otherwise that's one of the most common pathways out of certainty yeah and i think too if you haven't taken the time to think critically about this the most obvious measurement for is there something for me to do is is this painful therefore yep. the conclusion afterwards after i have my intervention is is this less painful as well and very often, as you were mentioning there before, this is a complex neurobiomechanical histological changes that are going on that regardless, anything short of some kind of, um, uh, you know, injection of a um, numbing, uh, yeah. it, you know, the intervention is not going to, to happen there as well. I was thinking, so going back to this too, I, I had several indicators of whether my adjustment had done what I wanted it to do, yep. none of them was, is it less painful for you? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, well, and so that's a really important distinction yes. for most chiropractors. If we look at that flow that we're talking about, we want philosophy, paradigm, procedures to all line up. Yes. The end point, the procedure of what's the test that, that works, that is, is less painful would make 100% sense if you started off in that physiotherapy philosophy yes. of our goal is to get rid of your pain. That's the, that's the end goal. Yes. If you have a philosophy that's different to that, that says yes. where we would like your pain to go, but really what we're about is this other thing, then you need to have 
ways of telling that you delivered on that other thing. Otherwise, we're going to default to those yes. pain-based things. So, but yeah, it's gone. I, I would wonder, though, even inside of that, even in a physiotherapy type sort of model, where if we took, let's say, post again, this will show the limitations of my um, uh, rehab knowledge with regards to peripheral joints. But let's just say that I'd broken my arm, therefore had not bent my elbow for a long time. I'd lost range of motion there too. I would say almost the objective of my care as a physiotherapist is probably to induce pain. Induce pain. <laughs> yeah. And it might be reasonable that after you finish some care with me, that this is actually more painful. And yep. I've done my job because I'm really clear in around what my pre and post is. And this is where the benefit of the physiotherapist being able to say, yes, I know it's more painful now, Angus, but straighten your elbow, see how much straighter it gets. Ah, yeah. so there's confidence, there's some kind of objective finding there. Yeah. And that's why it was, it was never a stress for me when a patient hopped off the table or said to me, ah, oh, Angus, it still hurts there. And I would go, and I was very happy to go, let me just check that for you, Martin. No, no, no. Legs are better balanced. This is changing here. There's a better range of motion that's changing through there. That's enough for today. I'll see you yep. on Thursday. And my yep. confidence and certainty was enough for that person to go, great, just wanted to check. Off we yep. go from there too. But without those objective measures for me to kind of look at, underpinned yep. by where I see pain and symptoms in the hierarchy of what's going on there too, you do end up uh, you know, without boundaries and and so on yeah, and yeah. so forth there too. So, uh, yeah, love it. Beautiful. Yeah. So uh, I think in terms of running through that paradigm, then what we've clarified there is we've worked on the philosophy and then we've said, all right, applying that philosophy in a less abstract way, because those initial ideas, super abstract. And paradigm is less abstract. It's sort of what's the model of uh, joint dysfunction, subluxation, attached to that what are the clinical rules that I will use what are the and then all of that then dives into the procedures which is how do I measure that on a visit to visit basis how do I me measure that with a lag so if we go back to that physiotherapy uh, model if we use their so yes in the short term visit to visit the measure that measurement of success on one visit is look what I can do with my elbow a functional mm -hmm. thing the measurement over and that's a lead indicator the lag indicator the indicator that you should see over a period of depending on their time frame six to 12 weeks let's say for instance is pain should reduce as well. Now, we need to have the equivalence of that. There will be, I don't think yes. it's really, so let's say EMG testing as a as an indicator, as an outcome, it's not a good test visit to visit. It's yes. expected with people who are chronically subluxated for that to go pretty crazy as the spine is adapting. Yep. <clears throat> but over a period of time, we've got some expectations and some, par some frameworks for it. Um, for uh, other tests, there's we're expecting leg length to change instantly. And if you apply your clinical care and there's no change in leg length, then I would argue that yeah, you might need to look at your technique or you may have more to do to, to get that person a step closer to where they need to be. Yes. Um, so, but the having a coherent suite of those tests in each of those domains is super important and then yes. it sort of raises one of the most important things which is often the testing that we do on a lag like a, a over a period of time isn't always aligned with our philosophy would be my experience so if we're looking at the big picture of chiropractic is this impact on the nervous system and the central nervous system we need to have a way of saying yeah, I'm certain that I've had an impact on that that's good for this person. Mm. Uh, and so looking at which part of my testing actually measures change with the nervous system over a period of time. So, yeah. So because uh, I, I, I want to, because I love that idea, I, and you reminded me that when you taught me before, of just define lead and lag indicators again. Oh, okay, sorry. Well. Yeah, it was probably... Yeah. Um, because so, they're, they're pivotal uh, to helping people on yeah. that visit-to-business basis to answer that question of, hey, doc, yeah. it's sore. Yeah. 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 So a lead indicator is really like a, a, a measurement that you can do visit by visit that says, yeah, this person is responding to my care. I know that I'm done for today. So I know that I need to do something for today. I know that I'm done for today. 
that's a lead indicator. It's something you can do that have, measures that their immediate state beforehand and then their acute response. And by acute, I mean shortened time frame, not related to acute symptoms. So you come in, I see you. All right, Angus, let's have a look and see how you're going. Whatever test tells me how you're going for the day. Yes. Let's do my thing and let's see that we accomplished a goal with what told me you were going. That's a lead indicator. A lag indicator is based on your initial assessment, it said to me that you had this period of sublux, at this level of subluxation that had probably been there for a super long time. Let's remeasure. I'm expecting to see some changes in those things after 12 weeks. So if I give an example of what yes. I would look in my practice, yes. um, I would expect there to be change in your posture maybe over a period of time. I would certainly, if we look at the insight into the um, nervous system function, I really like balance testing as a way of measuring are you getting pro uh, better afferent and therefore efferent input output to your nervous system yep. um, because your spine is doing better. And so balance testing would be two, thing, two examples of lag indicators. Yes. You could also use other things as lag indicators, but, but they're things that it requires the body to adapt to over a period of time that yes. reflect that bigger picture adaptation of their body to your care. Yep. So um, for our listeners, if you're thinking, the, the lead indicators that I used to use in practice Leg length was a big one. I practiced pretty much Thompson. So that was a big one that yeah. I would use. Um, I would use some others that are perhaps a little bit more subtle, like breath as well, yeah. watching in terms of how that might be flowing through as well. Local tissue in terms of, I found that there was a very often and most often an immediate change in local tissues in the area that I adjusted as well. And then also kind of local static um, as well as active range of motion as well. Yep. So those were the things okay. that I would check in amongst those kind of things. The lag indicators that I would look at, we used the subluxation station, we used yep. posture, and then we would periodically re-X-ray. Um, yep. And then along that too, to be honest, one of the lag indicators often were the symptomatic presentation that the person came in with, yep. you know, whether that whatever that would be as as well yeah, so and, yes and so it's useful i think to clarify so the paradigm that i practice with we do measure what people's symptomatic response is yes it's just going to be in a way that aligns with your philosophy and paradigm so yes. and and aligns over a time frame that is reasonable you know it's not reasonable to have somebody expect their uh Oswestry to change after one visit. It's just not the way that most issues change. Yes. Yeah. So, it, you know, our, our listeners, you have a bunch of different suggestions. And, and, and again, lots of these are very well supported by the science in terms of what should yeah. happen. You know, I, I, as I talked about something, I understand that breath, for instance, would not be something that I'd want to stand up um, and justify somebody's care based on chat. But it's it's one of those things that I will look towards there too. I'd feel much more confident, you know, talking about range of motion, for instance, yeah. as an indicator um, as, as well there too. So yeah, and I think it's useful to have a blend of those things. So yes. if we don't want this to be, on the, to me, there's a balance of you want to have the testing, you want testing that's useful. And yeah. the reality is that science for science lags behind practice so yeah. it's okay to use things that don't have randomized controlled trials yet to support their use yeah it's also important to to not be delusional and say look i can use just you know i can intuit it from the universe that this person needs an adjustment there i sort of think it's helpful to have something that has been tested like elements of palpation that you can have a degree of reliability, elements of, uh, of, of range of motion, for instance, that yeah. have support in the literature, those type of things. You, yeah. you want to you make sure that you've got the check and balance of that so that then as somebody, if say, for instance, if somebody's, uh, your observation of their breath had improved, but their range of motion and a whole bunch of other indicators hadn't, mm. you've got to sort of have the, the, doc, the, the self-awareness to go, oh, maybe I just want to see that their breath's changed and yes. I need to pay, they need, might need a different protocol of care. 
Yeah, love it, love it. So where to? So one last piece. One last piece, if I can. Yes, I'll just loop back. So I sort of pieced all these pieces of the puzzle together. So we've got certainty in our philosophy, yes. then we've clarified and become certain in our paradigm by defining what the model of subluxation is, what the clinical rules are around who we will take care of, who we won't, how we take care of people, what is our job, what isn't our job. Mm. Then we've applied procedures that are congruent with that. And I've been through the clinical procedures part mm. of it, the testing you're doing, the adjusting you're doing, how that interacts with that and the timeframes over which we're expecting to see those tests change mm. we've thought that through around is this reasonable and in what scenarios and how would I sort of apply those tests to sort of get a sense of severity and chronicity how bad is this or how impacted is their system by their subluxations their joint dysfunction and how long has it been like that so how much cumulative change do we have in surrounding soft tissues and then the final piece of the puzzle is the communication piece like how would i simply explain this to people uh in in a way that made sense to them now when I take people through a certainty workshop there's not a huge we're not going through everything you could do to define that but we're getting at least the the core piece of how we'd explain that core part of our paradigm and how our procedures plugged into that uh, and then you know I've got, then there's there's a lot of complexity to communication as you'd appreciate given how many times we've discussed it but that's the basic structure philosophy what, paradigm procedures clinical and communication what what are the missing pieces that most people have in the communication that's costing them certainty i think for a lot of them they've done things in a real kind of patchwork way where mm. they've said i went to a seminar and this guy explained a subluxation as a, a loss of light but then my i haven't defined what my paradigm is and if my paradigm has nothing to yeah. do with light then this communication doesn't really align with anything. And so I have a thing that sounded yes. really sexy when the person at the seminar said it, but I haven't defined it. Or uh, um, they haven't sort of clarified the paradigm enough to say, explain phases of care in a way that is yeah. that, that they feel certain in because they haven't plugged in what's the relevance of soft tissue healing timeframes for this person. Like, yes, there's a template around how we'd expect that, but is the is it the same for a six-year-old as it is for a 60-year-old? Yeah. Well, I would argue not. And then there's a lot of gradation in between. Yeah. For me, it comes back to right where I started with is I was trying to find certainty through communication, through yeah. clear methods of asking questions, of all that kind of stuff there too, but there was no foundations that it was built upon. And so therefore there yeah. was an incongruency there, which was always going to lead to, um, to breakdown. It, yeah. It's fantastic. I feel like, you know, that quote of the unexamined life isn't worth living. Um, yeah. I, I feel like to some extent, the unexamined practice is going to be very difficult. It's going to be, yeah. you know, uh, a practice for me anyway was difficult. We are working in a paradigm that goes against what the world says. For a lot of it, we have to be, uh, we have to think really clearly about these things if we're wanting to change thought processes and lead people through there as well. And it does take a great deal of one introspection for us as chiropractors, but also to really examine what are we doing? How are we going about it there too? And sadly, at this stage, this process really should be taught to us at school in terms of critical yeah. thinking. And we should just, but we're not at this stage um, as, as well. So the course that you um, are in the final stages of putting together, is going to be a really neat kind of delivery yeah. mechanism of that too, where it's not just, hey, go and buy it and do your own kind of thing there as well. Um, where are you up to with your current thoughts about how that's going to look uh, to help it's, uh, it's basically it's going to be a four-week program so the certainty program i've taught a version of this over a number of years yes and um it's it's got that core flow of it as, as the original one did but i did the uh seth godin marketing workshop a couple of years ago and he has a fantastic way 
of, to me, getting the advantages of both in-person workshops and online workshops and sort of getting in some ways the, the best of both worlds. So the advantage of in-person is that you kind of get that, uh, that ability to get some feedback and you're applying ideas to your style of practice and getting some feedback around your thinking on it, um, both from the presenter and from other participants. So there's that. We can't see our own blind spots. Um, so there's a real advantage of that in-person immersive experience. The challenge with an in-person experience is you're limited. I'm in Melbourne and people anywhere else either have to come to Melbourne to do it or yeah. there's they can't do that. Um, but also there's the, the downside of being the in-person model is it's by nature tends to be one afternoon and so you don't really get time to kind of think things through and go all right here's my first response to it actually now that I've got a, somebody's given me some feedback to that mm -hmm. I can update that and whereas the the advantage of the online programs that we've done like you say is that you know you can just buy it and you can consume it whenever you like and you've got it there forever so the idea with this program is it, it'll, it's four weeks beginning of week one there will be some lessons for you to do, some resources to support that, and then kind of an activity for you to do to apply these uh, ideas in your practice, your model. None of this is me trying to dictate what your model should be. And then there's an opportunity for you to get some feedback on that from me and from other participants so that you kind of get that benefit of a whole lot of people's thinking and you get to, to get your blind spots seen, which sounds, it sounds like it could be a bit uh, intimidating, but it's, it's a really friendly sort of process. It's just one of those things of, have you considered this? Mm. How about thinking about this? We resolve that conundrum this way yeah. so that you get maximum value out of it. And so that each week you'll have that lesson response some feedback so you can refine it. And then a new lesson or series of lessons will be week two, week three, week four. And you don't have to have week one lesson done and dusted. You can refine that as you go. And it's an organic process that allows you to kind of spend four weeks, essentially, like you say, the unexamined life. This is the examined practice, the examined yeah. career, the examined chiropractic perspective. Yeah. But done over enough time that you can enjoy the process there's not that time urgency to it and um, you get that benefit of both sides of it yeah D to me it's like it's you've got an online training from the pleasure of your own home but with coaching support community implementation yeah. and the ability to refine yeah. um, which is great buddy where do people find out about it uh, insideoutpractices.com and if you go to the online workshops it's the very top one in the list there certainty 2.0 beautiful dude well all our listeners out there if you're thinking about it stop just do it um martin's stuff is 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 really great so um i, you know, I just i can't overstate it enough they're very there are so many people across the world that over promise and under deliver. Um, Martin by his very nature does the opposite as well. So he won't say stuff. So I will. It's great. Do it. So as well, buddy, thanks again for a fascinating, riveting, wonderful conversation um, as, as well. And um, yeah, can't wait to continue to talk more. Thanks mate. I really appreciate it. Lo always love talking to you and love the opportunity to share with your audience. Thanks mate. Love it. Talk soon. See you man. Speak soon. Bye. If you've enjoyed listening to this podcast, you have to come and check out my Community Influencer Program. It's my monthly coaching program where we take all this material and I'll work with you to help you apply it, implement it and systemize it. The Community Influencer Group Coaching Program is designed to help you increase your practice income, impact and enjoyment. Join me over at anguspike.com forward slash join. That's anguspike.com forward slash join join. I'd love to see you there.